right. Good morning, everybody. My name is Tom Blount. I'm the campus pastor here in Emily City. I'm really excited that you took out of your busy schedule some time to come and hang out with us just a little bit. And as Pastor Tim said, a really short series. A lot of times, you know, we're not known as a church. It's just, you know, go book by book by book by book. We're more of a series. If you come one week, you're probably jumping right in. You get online, pick up if you missed the week before. And uh, we just finished a series, always going into series. This is a really cool two-part series that I really want you to understand. If you were going to skip any message, it would be today. Just kidding. You don't want to skip today because you're here, right? But anyways, uh, we, you, we, you're excited to be here, I hope, but I want you to understand, right on the money is really, really important. Now, this week, we're going to cover a couple things. It's our part, God's part, and I'm going to go through an array of things really, really quick, but I'm really asking God to speak to your heart because once you are able to really receive what God has for you today, I want you to understand, I say this many times, and I know you, I've had people in the lobby say, oh, you you just say that just to bring me back next week. I'm dead, dead, dead serious. Next week, I know it's Thanksgiving time. Some of you may be out of town, but what I want you to understand is next week, we're going to unpack some verses all throughout Scripture from Old Testament to New Testament that's going to show you how God's children can live in abundance, living in abundance. Because I don't know about you, we're going to look at a few verses today that isn't it a bummer when the end of the month comes and there's no money left? You know what I'm saying? I mean, if you get to the end of the month and you have no money left and you're in the red, that's even worse. But God wants you to live in abundance. So that's next week. I don't want you to miss it. Invite your friends because I know you probably know somebody that seems to live paycheck to paycheck to paycheck. God doesn't want you to live that way. He wants you to live in an abundance and actually be a blessing to other people. But this week, what we're going to do is, when you received your program, you came in a little bit different. There were some hard copies in there, some things to help you out, some really interesting ways on in how you actually can continue to be a great, great supporter of, of Heritage Church. But here's the thing. In there is some notes, and I need you to take some things. And you remember, every single time you come, I always try to give you something special, something extra, because look, when you take those notes home, you could actually use them all week, almost as a study guide to say, God, I just want to learn about this and this, and Pastor Tom brought this verse in, we didn't have it in our notes, because I really want you, not so much as what some people say, well, we got to go deeper. Well, what does deeper mean? How about we just live where God has us right now, keep digging in the Word of God, and grow. So grab your little notes there, take a pen, hey, quick. Quick question, quick survey. How many people realized that we have new pens at Heritage? I knew it. We pulled it off. They're so similar to the other ones. These pens, though, they write. So we're glad that you enjoy them. And so please make sure you uh, actually just uh, take some notes today. But what I do need to let you know today is, I I'm being honest with you, seriously, seriously honest, I am not an expert when it comes to money. I found out there's a common denominator. You're, you're going to get this. I think some of you are just really deep people and very, very smart people. But I, just, I realize, I'm 56 years old, that a common denominator in all of my bad, bad financial decisions, I was in on them. I was one of the people that were in on those bad financial decisions, so I'm not an expert. And here's another thing that I find when we talk a little bit about money, because people are a little, get a little tense, is they're like, well, I don't agree with you. I get that you won't agree with me on some things, but here's what I like to tell people. You have every right to be wrong, and you have to take it up with God. So you just go ahead and just listen today and just ask the Lord. I'm, I'm, honestly, I know I like to joke a little bit, but I want you to do something really, really special for me right now. This is an area that if you will expand in, if you will allow God to get a hold of you in, and maybe take you, you already are doing things like this, but go beyond. And some of you maybe catch up. I, I don't know. But we're all at different levels. Just say this. God, speak to me. I want to know the truth. Speak to me. Because you know what? He doesn't want you to buy into the devil's lies. He wants you to live a life of abundance. So you may not agree, but here's a couple things I want you to understand in getting started. There's always, always, always an our part, God's part. Now when I say always... There's always that person that, well, what about this exception? Okay, so maybe I shouldn't say always, but let me give you a couple examples. Here's what happens. God initiates in our lives, God's part. 
you respond, your part. You see what I'm saying? We love our part. The only way we can love is to receive God's love, his part. Do you see that? Do you see that? I can only love. People say, well, I love and I don't, I don't believe in God. Uh, you really can't love because it says we love because he first loved us. I pray my part. God speaks. You say, sometimes he doesn't speak to me. I pray he doesn't answer. I understand that. But he still is listening. There's always a, a my part. His, I trust. He's trustworthy. My part is, do I entrust the situations of life with God? He's trustworthy. He doesn't sleep. He doesn't slumber. Everything consists because of God. There is an our part. There is a God's part. And what I want you to understand, there are those people that will then say the exceptions is, well, you know, there's my, my rules. Now, you understand what you, what you say if you go that route. I get it. There's your rules and God's rules. You see the difference there? I'm not talking about now our part, his part. Many times we look at Scripture and get it miscombobulated, and our rules really aren't consistent with God's rules, so to speak, or God's initiative within our lives. Well, I don't know. Or we'll have in certain passages of Scripture, because we like to pick and choose the ones that make us a little feel a little better. Remember? What we said is God always points, Jesus always points to what seems absolutely impossible, but he never condemns us when we fall short of it. Why? He made a way. So what we'll say is, well, there's a law, and then there's grace. And Pastor Tom, we don't live under the law anymore. We live under today grace. I get it. But the law is still there for our learning. Andy Stanley says... You could read the Old Testament for inspiration. Now, I I understand why he says what he's saying. But we don't throw it out because we don't agree with it. God dealt with people in the Old Testament differently. He always was gracious. In the Garden of Eden, way before even the law, Adam had sinned. He was hiding. He was afraid. God's grace comes in and initiates, Adam, where are you? That's grace. And Adam responded in his part and said, I'm right here. I was afraid. So my point is this. You could say, well, it's law, it's grace. Then we'll say, well, the exception is it's Old Testament, it's New Testament. I get that. But I think what you'll find is when we unpack Scripture, you can't throw out the old and just say I'm in love with the new because here's the thing. If you love just the new, I got news for you. It's greater. In Jesus, everything is better. And so what we do many times is we pick and choose as we go through it. I really want you to ask the Lord right now and say, God, speak to me. I want to know truth. For instance, let me give you something. I would venture to say you've seen it on a plaque. You've seen it on a picture. You've seen it on a coffee mug. You've seen it maybe on TV. You've given it away in a greeting card. You've given it away in a birthday card. You've given it away in a wedding card, graduation card. Maybe you've given it away from the standpoint of just an encouragement. I can honestly tell you, I guarantee you, I have written this verse alone over a hundred times in a salutation where within the body of a quick little note that I send out, did you notice what Kyle said? Hey, you want to do it the old-fashioned way and just go see people face-to-face? Why do we call that old-fashioned? I think that's the best way. I'm just giving him a hard time because he's in the house today. Kyle Dobbemeyer's with us live today. Flesh and blood. You meet him today. You don't want to miss him out. But here's the thing. Jeremiah 29, 11 says this. And we love the verse. It says, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good. We like that, right? It's good and not for disaster to give you a future of hope. We've seen it all over the place. But do you realize when he wrote that? He says that in verse 11. And by the way, I'm not real bright, but verse 11 is after verse 10. And verse 10 says, well, 
This is what the Lord says to the nation of Israel. You will be in Babylon for 70 years. You're going to be in captivity. You're going to be in prison for 70 years. But then I will come and do for you all the good things I have promised. And I will bring you, all, bring you home again. And here's the thing. We like verse 11. But so here's my thing. Now some of you won't come back next week. I just want to go on record to say that God is going to put you in captivity and in prison for the next 70 years just so I can tell you God has good plans for you. Who wants to be a part of that? See, we're like, no, but we like it when he says, I know the plans I have for you. You see what I'm saying? So we'll take a verse, and you can say, but Pastor Tom, is that not true? Yeah, we are the seed of Abraham. But in grace, it's a whole lot better than in law. I'm glad I didn't live back then. It was crazy back then. But what I'm saying is you can't take one without the other. In fact, I've had friends of mine declare, declare what they have had stolen from them and use this verse. They would say, Joel 2.25, the Lord says. Now remember, we got to know who's he speaking to. The Lord said to the people of Jerusalem. Anybody here from Jerusalem? Anybody? Anybody? I know you're a chosen child of God, Ephesians, see? You're still chosen by God, adopted by God. But he says this, I will give you back. And then they usually say a hundredfold what, the, what you lost in the swarming locusts and the hopping locusts and the stripping locusts and the cutting locusts. It was I. This is a crazy part because some people say, well, God wouldn't do that to people. He said, it was I who sent this great destroying army against you. See, what we'll do is we'll claim all those good things. Well, you know what Satan has taken away from you, God will restore it a hundredfold. Yeah, we all want to sign up for that, right? But we can't throw out different things. We can't pick different things. And so here's my question to you because I really want to lay the foundation of what the truth of God's word is today for you. And again, I'm asking you, ask him, speak to me, Lord. I'm listening. I want truth. Everything that you have in your possession right now, it may be a lot. It may be an excess. It may be little. It may, you may be saying, but Pastor Tom, you have no earthly idea where I'm at today. It's nothing. Every clothes on your back, the house you live in, the car you drive, the truck you drive, the socks you have on your feet, the shoes that you wear, the money you have, the money that comes into your household. Everything you have currently and have had come through you, who gave it to you? God did. It's never been ours. It's never been ours. It's an amazing thing what we do is we lose sight of it. Well, you know, I'm the one that works hard. I get it. Who gives you the breath to breathe into your lungs and exhale? Who gives you the strength and the fortitude and the knowledge and the experience to do those things? I want you to understand at the very onset, giving has never, ever, ever, ever been about God needing something from you. It's always been something where God is saying, would you be a good steward? Would you be a good manager? Because I gave it all to you. Now what are you going to do with it? So what I want to do is real quickly look into what our part is. Take your pen out. Jot this down real quick. We, we give generously. We give generously. And while you're writing that down, I want you to catch this. And you may want to circle something in the verse or, or, or underline something or highlight it. Listen to what he says. Paul's writing here to the church at Corinth. And he's writing in, in, Cor in Corinthians. And he says this. He says this. You must each decide in your heart how much to give. Do you realize it is up to you? God initiates in our lives. He gives us everything. And now I have been had initiation in my life. Now I respond to God with a gracious heart, open heart, don't understand it all the time. But now I respond to God and I decide what I'm going to give. But notice what he says. And don't give reluctantly or in a response to pressure. I, that, that's, here's the thing that drives people away from church. If you're a visitor, a guest today, here's the deal. You're like, oh my gosh, of all the days I showed up, I show up on the day they talk about money. Yeah, I, I had a guy in a, in a lobby here. He said, man, that, that was the best ever on, on just how God gives us. And he says, but you'll probably lose a few. So I looked him in the eye. He says, right, will you be back next week? He was like, oh, I can't believe that church always talks about money. And we don't hear. But we thought 
What a perfect opportunity in this season, this holiday of Thanksgiving. Why not focus on something that means so much to people, that impact people's lives so greatly? But it's not pressure. You decide, God says. And so here's what he says, though. God loves a person who gives cheerfully. So when we take an offering, if you're a guest, please keep your money in your wallet. But I want everybody to laugh hysterically while you're putting your money in the offering bucket here in just a little bit. Would that be all right? No, that didn't go over very well. Okay. So he says, and God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. Can I ask a question? Do not raise your hand. But wouldn't it be amazing that all that you make, all of a sudden, you had plenty left over? I mean, I'm like, I want to sign up. Where do I sign up, right? It's that God is saying, give cheerfully, not because you're pressured. You'll have everything you need and plenty left over to share. See, we like the plenty left over, but we don't like the sharing part. So he says, as the scripture says, They share freely, give generously to the poor. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. We'll get to that in just a moment. So we, as God's people, give generously. Now let's move to God's part. That was our part. Now there's our part, then there's God's part. And so now God says, hey, here's my part. God says God multiplies abundantly. Now, just a little bit of information. I'll read the verse, but I'm telling you, we will unpack this next week. You do not want to miss next week how you can live in the abundance that God has for you. Now, notice what he says. He continues, he says, for God. Can you circle the word God there? Because here's the thing. For God, not you, not your boss, not your wife, not your husband, not your kids, not your aunt, not your uncle, not your friends, not your... It it says, for God is the one who provides seed for the farmer. He's the one that provides for you. He's the one that provides for me. And then bread to eat. In the same way, he will provide, look what he says, an increase in your resources. I'm telling you, everybody would like it. I can't tell you how many times I've had people say, hey, man, what are you really praying for? Man, I'd like to get a raise. Or I'd like to get a better job where I'm making more money. I just had somebody share something with me Here not too long ago, they said that they found out that where they're at and all of the decisions they made, where they're at right now, they have to start making $1,000 more a month, 12 grand more a year. I want you to think about that. That's not easy for everybody. It's very rare to just instantly get a $12,000 increase. They're in a tight situation. Maybe you're in a tight situation. I don't know. But he said he will provide. That's God. Remember what you circled? God will provide. God will give the increase in your resources. It's God then uh, will produce a great harvest of generosity. Where? In you. You need to circle the word you. God's part, your part. Our part, God's part. You become more generous. He produces something in you. Look what he says. Yes, you will be enriched in every way. So what does it say? So that you can always be generous. Always be generous. God loves a cheerful giver. And when we take your gifts to those who need them, look at what he says. I love this part. They will thank you. No. They're going to thank God. Because here's what it's always about. When we make it about God, isn't it interesting? He immediately turns in and says, no, it's really about you. God, it's really about you. The battle belongs to you. And then you get to experience the victory. The battle belongs to you. You get to experience the victory. It's always been about you. For God so loved the world. So my point is, there is your part. There is God's part. But people, watch how you live. And you are so generous because God did a work in you that it comes to the surface that people see things and they're like, don't get me wrong. They're going to thank you. They're going to say things nice about you. But really what they're going to do is, what we want them to really do is thank God for what God has done. Now, here's the thing. You've heard me say this so many times. What you believe matters. I'm going to say it again. What you believe matters. Because what you believe 
drives your thinking. Your thinking is derived from what you believe, not what you know. Now, you know a lot of things, but you live out what you believe. So what you begin to think in the midst of your marriage, in the midst of your finances, in the midst of all of what's going on in your life, and everything, what you believe drives your thinking. And when we think, we begin to act. But again, it's driven by what we truly believe. There's two beliefs. There's two ways of thinking. Scarcity and abundance go in cycles. Jot that down. Scarcity and abundance go in cycles. Now, I want you to jot that down because here's the thing. There is a a cycle for scarcity and there is a cycle for abundance. And I, I kid you not, I like what Gary Smalley calls it in the DNA of relationships when it was a relationship. It's the fear dance. It's a cycle. Somebody pushes your button, you fear it's never going to change, so you respond, and you respond in fear, and then you go and do this thing, and then it's just a, you're, you're dancing, you're arguing, okay? It's the same thing with what you believe about finances. It's the thing, same thing you believe about our part, God's part, is this. The scarcity cycle is this. God provides. Now, when God provides, then we consume it. We just talked about this last week. You know what I'm talking about in James. We consume it because then we lack because we've consumed it all, you see, and we fear, oh, it's never going to change. So what do we do? We consume again. You see the cycle there? Leave it up on the board. I want you to see it. When God provides, because he always provides, what we do, we consume it upon our own lust, our own desires, our own plans, okay? Okay? We lack because it's not a good plan, you see? And then we begin to fear, man, it's always going to be the same way. I'm always going to get to the end of the month, and I don't have any money left over. And matter of fact, I don't even get to the end of the month, and I'm already broke. And we fear, and then we consume. God provides. We consume. We lack. We fear. We consume. People believe that all the time. Do you know what I said? They believe that. It's not just thinking. It's thought because that's what we truly believe, because that's what we're living. But also, when we look at the abundance cycle, it is an amazing difference. Because God provides, because did we not say he always provides? He does provide. So, well, Pastor Tom, he's not providing for me like he's providing for you. Well, we don't need to talk about it. Or he's not providing like my, my aunt, uncle, my brother, my sister. Look, here's what he says about the abundance. God provides, we give. That's so key. That is so key. When God provides, we ought to give first. When God provides, I believe wholeheartedly, haven't mastered it until these latter years, is that I seriously believe we need to learn to live on 70% of every dollar we make. You say, are you nuts? I kid you not. You need to give first 10%. You need to save 10% short term. And you need to save 10% long term. Could you imagine if you started that 20 years ago, where you'd be today? The cycle is we give, God multiplies it, our faith grows, and we give again. Because here's the thing I learned as just a young boy, and I grew up in church. You said, well, I didn't grow up in church. That's great. I'm glad you didn't. I had to unlearn some of the things that were wrong. All I'm saying is when God provides for us, we begin to give, and God multiplies all of that, and our faith begins to just grow, and so we give again. Because what we want to talk about is the power of a tithe. You say, I knew it. I knew we'd talk about it. Hey, look, I'm just going to share something with you, because remember what I told you? I want to give you what God says. Here's what you did. You liked what you heard in the New Testament, and it talked about giving. But when we start using what Malachi says, we're like, eh, I don't know. But let me share with you the power tie because I want you to know the truth. And the truth activated in your life as the word of God says, the truth shall set you free. Look at what the power of the tithe is. In Malachi, the prophet writes under the inspiration of God, he says this, you people are robbing me, your God. And here you are asking, God says you're robbing me. And then all of a sudden we're like, well, Where? Where are we robbing you? And he says it. How are we robbing you? You are robbing me of the offerings and of the 10% that belongs to me. We've already settled it. Who owns it all? 
He does. And we fight and feud, and, and he just gets so fearful over just 10%, you see. And it's already his. Remember, it's management. It's stewardship. So he says here, and of the 10% that belongs to me, that's why your whole nation is under a curse. And look what he says. I am the Lord all-powerful. And he says it. I love this part. I learned this when I was young. I challenge you to put me to the test. Friends, listen to me. All through the word of God, I've read it cover to cover multiple times. All through the word of God, it's the only place God says, I challenge you with finances. He says, I challenge you. I test you. He said, I, I want you to put me to the test, is what he says. I want you to prove me, depending on what translation. Bring me the entire 10%. Okay, into the storehouse, that's God's work, and so that we will, that so that there will be food in my house, then look what he says, then I, God, will open the windows of heaven and flood you with blessings after blessings. That's the power of a tithe. Now here, here's what tithing is, real quick. Let's just run right through this. Tithing teaches you and me to put God first. It, it, it's a really simple thing, because here's the thing. When you do this, you'll find you'll put him first in your marriage. You'll find you'll put him first with the talents that he's given you. You'll find that you'll put him first. It's an amazing thing. I've often said, I, I don't hit this subject hardly ever, ever off, because my belief is this, and I'm so excited to share this in a whole message with you, is this. When God has your heart, he has everything else. And if God has you, that means he has your checkbook. That means he has your talents. He has your tithe. He has your talents. He has your time. Can you imagine if you gave God two hours and 40 minutes a day? He said, there ain't no way in the world I could do that. Real easy here. I'm just trying to be easy. Not to condemn you. Not to have you feel guilty. There's there now no condemnation to them who are in Christ. I'm not, not, I don't want you to live under a cloud of condemnation. Safe to say the average American watches more than two hours and 40 minutes a day of TV. Oh, you're, you're meddling. No, I'm not meddling. We say we don't have time. You see what I'm saying? God is saying here, it teaches us. Look what it says. The whole purpose of tithing in Deuteronomy is to teach you to always put God first in your lives. John says it this way. John says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Now, here's what some people have said. I don't think God commands us to do anything. Remember what I said at the beginning? You don't, you don't have to believe me. You could just be wrong and take it up with God. I'm, I'm, I'm being as nice as I possibly can because here's what I want you to know. There's a lot of things I don't understand. There's a lot of things that I don't understand, but I don't have to disagree with God. I can just say, God, you're initiating this in my life. I don't understand it, but I'm going to trust you because you're trustworthy. My part is I'm going to trust you. Because you're trustworthy. I'm going to love you because you first loved me. You see, it's altogether a different way of thinking. The whole purpose of the tithe is that Tom Blount would not focus on what I've got, but I would focus on who I have, who has me. And so the teaching of a tithe is to put God first, but tithing also does this. It builds our faith. It builds our faith. Look at how he continues to write here. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. That there may be food in my house. And he says this, different translation, NIV. It says, test me in this. Test you in what? With the tithe. He says, says the Lord Almighty, and see. See if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. Listen, when you test God, when you prove God, when you go to God and you give back to him first, all, I'm not just talking all, but this is a tithe, wouldn't you rather have so much come back you wouldn't know where to put it all, right? But here on the negative side, what happens is when we grip it and hold it, the parable says of one guy, he had so much, he goes, oh, I'm going to tear down my barns, I'm going to build bigger barns because I don't have enough room to store everything I got. Can you imagine having to take your funds to two different banks because it wasn't insured? Some of you know what I'm talking about. Do you realize that there's only so much a bank will insure a certain limit? You say, I haven't reached it yet. But could you imagine? That you had to have two banks, three banks, four banks. 
God said, I'm going to bless you. Now, I'm not saying this is a blab it, grab it, name it, and claim it thing. That's not what I'm saying. God is saying, test me. Prove me. Our part is to give. God's part is to bless it. But here's what I really like. Look what Hebrews says. Because I wonder who I'm really trusting. Hebrews says, now faith is a confidence. Your faith grows, right? Giving grows my faith. Faith is a confidence in what we hope for and the assurance of what we do not see. You don't see it. I don't see my finances. I don't. Listen to me. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. That is so key in all of our lives. Without faith in my marriage, without faith in my finances, without faith in my time, my treasure, and all that. Without faith, it's impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe. You see, believe because what we think is derived from our belief. We must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. So what we see here is tithing teaches us to put God first. Tithing actually grows our faith and builds it up. But here's one last thing, and you got to hear this. Tithing provides for the work of God's church. Let me just read this and make a couple comments. Bring the whole tithe. I get it that there are these other ministries out there that need your help. There's other ministries all over. I'm talking about the local New Testament church. You can give to all the ministries, but be very careful with that because, boy, it's an amazing thing, especially this time of year. I want you to understand, he's talking about where you're encouraged, where you're blessed, where you serve. Where you come. He says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food for what? My house. That we may be able to minister to one another. We may be able to go forth out of here. Because I'm here to tell you, I was on the phone with Jeff the other day. And I, I know I might sound like I'm talking a little bit fast because I'm learning to, to just, you know, try to take a breath. But here's the thing. Jeff was sharing with me the other day about the Timothy Initiative. When Judy and I were in Florida, I completely forgot that about 45 miles to the north, Jeff and, and, and Bonnie were in, uh, uh, in, uh, up north of us a little bit in Boca Raton with the Timothy Initiative. I grew up in church, and maybe you didn't, but you got to hear this, and I hope the Holy Spirit speaks to you. Christ cannot return again for his bride until all tongues hear the good news until every nation every tongue hears about the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ you say what's that got to do with tithe it has everything to do with our tithe when we tithe here we begin to build churches abroad for 300 bucks we learned last year about the Timothy initiative that we can launch a church to what an unchurched tongue an unchurched nation so to speak they are anticipating and seeing with technology the way it is now. We have identified now every single tongue that has not heard the gospel yet. You, you, hang with me, it's so important. They anticipate, I'm 56, my generation, and if you're hearing my voice, your ge- they're saying within five years or so, plus or minus, Every tongue could possibly hear of Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. You say, what's that got to do with it? It doesn't mean that the first time that that finally goes to the last nation that Jesus is like, oh, we're out. But, but, it could. Because God initiates. And when you give and we launch another church and another church and thousands of churches because it's amazing what we could do now with technology and then the way that we're now doing missions. In our generation, the entire world could hear that Jesus Christ loved them enough, died upon the cross, gave his life for their sins, and they could say, I believe. And Jesus said, then he could come back. Our generation. We used to sing a song when I was a kid that Jesus Christ will return maybe morning, maybe noon, maybe evening, but will be soon. He's coming back. And you say, what's that got to do with tithing? Everything. What, it, what really matters at the end of the day? I, 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 look, I get it. Maybe some of you don't have as much food as somebody next to you, but here's the thing. Man, we got a roof over our head. We got things going on in our lives, and we're eating. We got clothes on our back. You got a vehicle to drive. Do you realize some of the vehicles that we have today are more money than the first house I ever bought for 19 grand? Blows my mind. 
We get so caught up in the now. I want to give you four simple truths, and I'm not even going to comment on any of these, so to speak, in any length. I'm asking God to speak to you. Look, I am not here to condemn you. I am here to encourage you. But I want you to understand something. The very first thing you need to fill out is stealing from God has significant consequences. Mom and Dad, you teach your kids all the time, your choices matter. Why? Because they bring a consequence. I am so glad that I'm saved by the grace of God, that there is there now no condemnation to them who are in Christ. No condemnation, but my choices bring consequences. And robbing God brings a consequence. God blesses us when we bring the whole tithe. Man, I want you blessed far and above and beyond anything you can ever think of, ask for, or even imagine. Not only that, the church is blessed when God's people are blessed. I'm telling you what testimony after testimonies have talked about how some of you have said, I am so blessed because of this church. And we do it together. Why? Because we want this entire community to be blessed. And the last is the world is blessed when God's churches are blessed. I'm here to tell you, try it, he says. Malachi says, try it, put me to the test. Your crops will be in abundance, for I will guard them from insects and disease. Your grapes will not fall to, from the vine from before they are ripe, says the Lord of heaven of the armies. And listen to what he says. Then all nations will call you blessed. Can I just gently remind you again? God's system of giving and giving to the local church wasn't because he needed your money. Do you know what it really comes down to? It's stewardship and management. We say, well, God, he just needs my money. Church always says, no, no, no. We need God. He doesn't need my dollar, but I need God. And I can't afford to live without him. And I don't want to live without him. And I want you to come along with the journey. So I want to ask you a question. Don't mistakenly think or believe that God needs your money. We need God. Can you imagine if for just the, ne ju look, just the next 90 days, what if you said, I'm taking God's challenge? I'm going to test him. It's going to be hard, but I'm going to put him to the test. And I, I'm going to challenge him to open up his big window of blessing. Now, I want you to be a cheerful giver. It's hard sometimes. I get that. But what I want you to understand is this. Can you imagine what would happen? My prayer for you is, first of all, you would know Christ. But my prayer for you also is that we would put God to the test and reach souls that we haven't reached yet with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, I ask you right now, Lord, that you might minister to us in the close of this service in a way like never before. Lord, I'm going to ask that if there's somebody here underneath the sound of my voice that for the very first time, as you, Holy Spirit, are wooing them. That they would admit that they're a sinner. Believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and confess with their mouth that you are Lord. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I want to give you the greatest news of all. It's not about the money. It's about you right now. Do you know beyond any shadow of a doubt that if you were to pass away right now, heaven would be your home. And you say, Pastor Tom, no. I was in this denomination or this religious place. It's not about that. It's about you having a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Would you right there where you're seated call upon the name of the Lord and be saved? Would you tell him right now, Lord, I believe that you died upon the cross to save me from my sins. I ask you right now to come into my heart and save me. Be my Lord and Savior. It's my heart's desire to follow you. Father, in the close of our service, perhaps for the very first time for some people here, We'll close out a little differently. But I'm asking, Lord, that as we sing a simple song, a beautiful song, that we return to you and surrender it all. Whether it's the financial part that we talked about today, yes, that's important, but our lives, who we are. Lord, there's so many needs here. Marriages need to be mended. Lives need to be changed. People that have diseases need them ripped out of their bodies. And Lord, they need Jesus. 
I pray that they would be healed today. I pray, Lord, that mentally, emotionally, and physically people get healing today when they say, I surrender all. So, Father, thank you for meeting with us today. Thank you for saving the sinner and stirring the hearts of us saints. We love you. We thank you for what you're doing in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you pray with me again? Father, it's my heart's desire that every single person under the sound of our voice, with what faith they have today, they just turn to you and say, God, Jesus, I surrender it all to you. Whether it's a marriage, whether it's a relationship out, Lord, there in the world where they're living in the midst of their work days, whatever co-workers. Father, whether it's their finances or health, Lord, I just pray 
that we would surrender it all. And so, Lord, thank you that you are trustworthy as we trust you. And thank you that we can surrender to somebody that loves us the way you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated.